Good Growth Podcast. In each episode, we'll be speaking to leaders in business and digital across a range of sectors, from retail to media, education to innovation, and many more. So sit back and enjoy. On this edition of the Good Growth Podcast, I speak to Baroness Margaret Madonna, co-founder of the leading diversity business, The Pipeline. In this podcast, we delve into the challenges organisations face in reducing the gender representation gap at board level, their appetite to affect change, and how the pipeline, through their diversity diagnostic tool, Genie, help these organisations prompt change. Margaret also describes the role Good Growth have played in helping get the best out of their data. But first, we start with a look at Margaret's career and passion for politics and football. Margaret, thank you very much for joining me on the on the Good Growth Podcast. Welcome. Lovely to talk to you, Dan. So uh, before we dive in uh, things, the pipeline in particular, Jeannie, um, a little background on you. Uh, I understand that you were uh, former CEO of the Labour Party um, during their successful election campaigns. Um, you've been uh, on a non-exec of a FTSE 100 company, but Interestingly, as well, a passionate supporter of AFC Wimbledon. Is that correct? That's correct. And uh, I think I do choose organisations that have great highs and lows. <laughs> uh, so I joined the Labour Party in the 1970s when I was still at school. 1978 wasn't a good time to join the Labour Party, if you know anything about uh, history, because we had 18 Uh, years out of office after uh, losing the general election in 1979 Uh, and I was very proud to be part of a small team that took the Labour Party from the hard left to the centre left uh, and got it electable and was able to be general election coordinator in 97 uh, and as you say general secretary in uh, 2000 and one, and uh, now as we're coming up to this Saturday, when we uh, an elect uh, a, a new leader, a uh, new leader which presumably is going to be Keir Starmer, that the next generation are going to have to do that again, take the Labour Party from the hard left to the centre left. But it was a fantastic experience, and a bit like AFC Wimbledon, you know, I I first supported it with going with my dad. I'm I'm sure that. You know, many of your listeners have those experiences of going with a member of your family and that was something you did together. And uh, we did that when Wimbledon were in the Southern League and we saw it uh, climb to Division One, as the Premiership was called then, and beating Liverpool in the FA Cup uh, for then for it all to fall apart uh, and for it to be resurrected from the ashes by its local community who uh, we all banded together and brought the club back to life and um, now we're in the process of building a new home at Plough Lane where we were originally mm-hmm. and we've come full circle so I'm I'm hoping that that's going to happen to the lay party as well. Yes um, I, I can relate I mean I'm I'm a passionate Plymouth Argyle supporter. So unfortunately, I was there on that day at Wembley when AFC Wimbledon uh, beat us to win promotion to League One. Um, But it was an incredible story that day. It very much felt like Wimbledon's day, just the the, the story and the, uh, like you say, the resurrection. Um, Yeah, brilliant. And we're everybody's, um, we're everybody's, you know, we're a fan favourite, aren't we? Kind of everyone's second team because it is that dream and it's a bit like the Labour Party people do identify with the values of the Labour Party more than any other political party but from time to time they just feel they can't vote for it I think they're kind of um I think that I think they're very very similar I can certainly see the yeah certainly see the connection there um so moving on uh to the pipeline then uh established in 2012 uh, just a bit of back, give us a bit of background on how and how and why did you uh, co-found the pipeline? Um, well, as you just said in some of your opening remarks, when I finished with the Labour Party, I had a second career in business and I did non-executive work for many big uh, global organisations, the FTSE 100 
company standard life uh, as it was then, now uh, Standard Aberdeen, organisations like Abertis, a big global infrastructure company. Uh, and the thing that I learned, whether it was politics, football, business, is that you achieve by having strong teams and you only get a team when it's made up of different people. Yeah. You don't get teams from everyone being the same or everyone playing the same role or in the same place on the football pitch. That's not what a team is. That's just a collection of individuals. Uh, so uh, one of the things I was very shocked at um, when I finished in politics was to uh, look at the numbers out there. And um, I was um, reading an article by Alice Thompson in The Times, and she said corporate UK had lost... 40% of senior women over the previous decade, wow. which I thought was really horrific, particularly when you look at the stats. And there are very senior, very few senior women. So um, I'll just talk about the FTSE because it's a, an easy thing to get around your, um, get your arms round. Uh, in the FTSE 350, if we look at executives on main boards, executives... 93% are men and 7% are women. If we look one down at the Exco, 86% are men. And these, these figures are not shifting. Um, and so where we come at it, uh, Lorna Fitzsimons, my co-founder and I, is not really from an equality issue, but from a business issue. We all need strong organisations that are doing well. Mm -hmm. We can see this now um, through times of the coronavirus. If organisations aren't out there doing well, then there is no wealth creation for the hospitals and schools and all the public services that we need. The same in the banking crises. You need banks to do well. You need them to be sustainable over the long term. And you do that with strong diverse teams because if the team isn't diverse you don't have a team and therefore the biggest thing is to get men and women to work together this is not about replacing guys it is about collaboration and so we set up the pipeline because both Lorna and I had reached the top of our organizations against the grain and therefore we had thought we could help other women and organisations to get there. Because, look, if women, women are very used to getting things done. If they could do it on their own, mm -hmm. they would have already done it. So it's also about uh, getting the organisations to do some stuff. Uh, that's, a, that's a brilliant uh, context behind the pipeline and why founding the pipeline, excuse me. Um, and on the off the back of that, I guess, so you've... Um, you've got Genie, which is a, a diagnostic tool to to help organisations begin addressing uh, that diverse that diversity and, and this diversity gap. Um, can you just give us a bit of a background again behind Genie then, and, and, and what the concept is behind that? Uh, absolutely, uh, Genie is a quantitative diagnostic tool. Part of the problems with organisations is their flooded with data aren't they mm -hmm. but really what's happening how are people feeling how can you bring about change what's going wrong what are the patterns in there what's the uh you know what are the two or three three things you can do to uh, make a difference and uh, at the pipeline we've put all uh, of the academic research and our primary research together quantitative data and we're now testing it against organizations using a gap analysis so organizations can find out what is the barriers is it in the way that they're communicating is it in um, the way that uh, they are providing development uh, is it in the way that they're going about their recruitment and their promotional processes? Or are individuals and groups within the organisations 
um, finding it difficult to navigate their way through the organisation. And we can look at that on a gender basis, but we can also look on it in terms of ethnicity, social class, age, roles, uh, globally. Uh, and we can see where people are having problems and the way that organisations can improve inclusion because productivity is a real issue for all of us. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. if we look at Europe, if we look um, more broadly around the world, most people's productivity is slowing. And for some of us since the banking crisis, it's just bumping along the ground. So your start to improving productivity has got to be everybody coming to work, feeling that they can make a contribution, feeling that they belong, feeling that their voice is heard and having that difference in people. So we know, for example, if you look at um, somebody like um, Sylvia Ann Hewlett's work, we know that if you have one person in a team that is representative of your customer groups, that team, their understanding of that client group goes up or client or customer group goes up by 66%. So that's where organisations need to get to. They need to get there before the coronavirus and certainly they need to get there as we come out of it. So very much using data then uh, as we uh, to, to prompt organisations um, to action change. So then in this data heavy world, why, why data led then? Um, and what difference do you think they, being, having a data led approach makes? And um, I think one of the big problems around diversity and in inclusion is really not understanding the other person. Um, we think they, they think like us, and the reality is they don't. Men and women don't think the same. They're socialised differently. They have different economic experiences, but they also have physiological, chemical, biological difference that gives them that wonderful diversity that makes life interesting um, and the only way to understand those differences is to see them in data I mean you, you must know that when you hear people talk about diversity and inclusion everyone's got their pet topic haven't they everyone thinks in different ways but it's not about what we think it's about what is the reality of what's going on? Yeah. And if we're not careful, we spend a lot of time and a lot of investment into things that don't actually work. And we're ticking a box, thinking that we've done something and we've done nothing at all. So an example of that would be some of the training um, that goes on. For example, unconscious bias training. That doesn't work. It's been proven not to work. And in some organisations, it's made life even more difficult. It's prevented progress. So we're all about doing what works. And the starting point has got to be understanding where people are at, how they feel, what they need in place to be able to maximise their contribution to the organization yeah that makes a lot of sense um and yeah giving them the facilities to be able to make that change from an organization's point of view but also at an, at an individual level as well absolutely so your your data-led approach is uh, does tie in um quite nicely with how, uh, how good growth um like to work as well um very much a, a data-centric and and given uh, businesses a reality view of what their state situation is performance is um, with good growth what uh, how have how has good growth helped you then get the best out of your day sounds like we, we work in uh, similar methods but how so how then has good growth helped you get the best out of that data that you've got I think good growth has helped us on a number of um, le levels first of all in practicing what we 
preach, mm-hmm. uh, and that is diversity. Being a data partner with us uh, gives us a different perspective and challenge. You're geographically in a different place uh, than uh, us, and you come from uh, different educational and work experiences, which is extraordinarily helpful. We're subject experts, and you are data lists. Uh, whether you come from a mathematical perspective or some of you have got PhDs in chemistry, engineering, biology and so on, it is a completely uh, different perspective to us. And I think that it's about the and our subject expertise, understanding of the research and you're more, if I can put it this way, clinical, what is the evidence here? Um, Data analysis from sort of standing three steps back from the issue. I think that collaboration brings great insight to a client's data. Yeah. Yeah. And and I guess as well, it it ties back in with that uh, diversity and adding uh, different aspects to a team. Good growth is essentially an ext- aim to be an extension of the pipelines team and give you that, I guess, outside perspective. Would that be fair? Outside, and you've got great people with great brains really interested in this subject, but you only see as um, scientists what you see. Mm-hmm. And it is that challenge that's great for clients. So to, ra- to wrap up, I'm really interested in, getting your views on um the more the the bigger picture i guess and you touched on a few figures earlier um first of all did did you sense then an appetite from organizations to approach change embrace change and and affect change i think there is a range i think in theory that this is something that most people want to do i think that they struggle with how to do it And I think that right now, people are firefighting, aren't they? You know, you've had the banking crisis, you've now got the pandemic. People want to do this, but every day, barriers come in their way. And in those moments of anxiety, it's very easy to fall back on what you know, doing what you've done in the past, hiring the people that look like you because it's comfortable and easy and particularly when you're going through very challenging times but you do have to break out of that because it is the diversity and collaboration that will help us through these periods of change and it's not just these two big things you know we've got this fourth industrial revolution we're going through things you know 400 years ago, we had our first industrial revolution. 300 years ago, our second. Both you and I, Dan, even though you're a lot younger than me, in our lifetimes, we've been through two industrial revolutions. We now have 90, you know, post the Iron Curtain going, we have 90 million people transversing the globe. Yeah, It's all stopped now with the pandemic. But it, you can't stop these tides, and therefore, how do you how how do you get people working together? Because the problems we're facing are big ones. So I think people really want to do it. Uh, I think they don't always know how, and I think genie is just a very easy way to say, look, here are the things that you need. This is what you need to be saying as a leader. This is what your people are hearing. This is how they're feeling. This is what your managers need. You know, developing and building and leading diverse teams is very difficult for people. Um, It requires lots and lots of personal confidence if you're trying to get the most out of somebody when you haven't had their life experience and you're anxious aren't you? You're always anxious not to uh, upset them. Mm -hmm. You know, we can tell in the organisation where people, you know, are being left behind. Um, 
and need to be more included. So I, I, I just think this is a, a fantastic tool and your partnership with us on this is great. Thank you. And um, final question from me is, uh, or two parts to it. How, firstly, how much progress then do you think has been made in helping increase diversity? What is there still to do, do you think? Well, I there is clearly a lot to do at the most senior roles. Uh, I think people get this. I think that we're going to see, we are going to see change. But I think with everything in life, unless you keep working at it, it won't happen on it, its own. Um, you know, to have 93% of executives on main boards in the FTSE 350 that are all men, that just is not good uh, for our organisations and not to have other perspectives, you know, just um, we work with many different organisations. We know, for example, that most buy decisions, um, you know, approximately women make up three quarters of all purchase decisions Jaguar Land Rover tell us that by 2025, uh, women will make up all purchase decisions of vehicles. Wow. Um, you know, but they've organisations have been slow to include women. And if they're going to do well in the future, they need to do that. And while yes. women, you know, I think sometimes people make a mistake of thinking, oh, well, women are only one group. You know, there is the greatest breadth of diversity bet between men and women. And if you include women, um, we will, we know that women are very good at them um, bringing on and including other un underrepresented groups. So I guess it's fair to say that it's not just, just men and women. There's ranges within women, different skill sets, different uh, ability different sets and the same within men as well and by say only having 93 percent of men as uh 93 percent of execs being men um you're missing out on main boards on main boards you're missing out you're basically cutting in half your range of thinking your range of thought your range of creativity decision making etc right yeah perfect in the nutshell <laughs> um margaret brilliant that's thank you very much for talking to me um it's been fascinating to hear your uh, experience your views and um, and where you, and where you see uh, diversity going forward as well. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Dan, and good luck. Thank you.